Hi, welcome to class. My name is Don LaFon, Professor Don, and this week in our A-plus hardware class, we are covering my, uh, Chapter 5, Disassembly and Power. Uh, we're actually going to also talk about reassembly, because anybody can disassemble something, but to actually turn around and put it back together again, that's a little bit more challenging in most cases. Ask my wife. I've got plenty of things I've taken apart and not put back together again. Let's go ahead and start. get started. I'm, go, I'm going to uh, share my screen. And I need to move this over here. And I need to start my presentation. And one more step over here. I also like to open the chat room. Uh, I have students with me right now. And if you, if I ask, sometimes they get stuck on a word. If I ask a word, uh, ask for help, please uh, help me out, guys. Um, I don't know. My brain sometimes just forgets words. It's kind of weird. Um, but we are just about ready to go. Okay. I think that's it. All right, Disassembly and Power, Chapter 5. Uh, this presentation covers the qualities of a good technician, disassembly, and static electricity, tools needed to work on computers, reassembly, power supply basics, and power protection. Again, this is a very basic presentation to get you started in your learning. It covers the chapter of the uh, textbook that are um, from Cheryl Smith, uh, the A plus certification uh, textbook. Let me, let me open that book. Let me open that page. That's this book here, the complete guide to A plus hardware and software. Uh, we have the eighth edition uh, to cover. So this is the introduction uh, to um, power. Let's go with the next slide. So qualities of a good technician. Let's talk about that first. So uh, soft skills are super important for uh, technicians to be able to communicate with people that aren't technical in nature. And we've each week we've been talking a little bit more about how you can be a better technician to be able by being able to relate. This week we are talking about written communication skills um, and uh, common mistakes people make. Um, is to not doc not complete documentation in a timely manner. You really should complete your documentation as soon as you complete any task that you do on a piece of equipment. Uh, it's critical, uh, in, especially in networking, for example. I have seen where ports on a switch have not worked for years, and yet nobody has taken the time to write uh, anything down about the problems of a switch or a router, for example, and then, and then uh, I have students that go and they try to use that same switch uh, with a port that really doesn't work and it's known not to work, but there's no documentation. And then uh, when I bring it up to the people that uh, are in charge of fixing the hardware, they're like, oh, yeah, we know about that. That port hasn't worked in a long time. It's like, well, how am I supposed to know that? They actually... Uh, found a sort of uh, a solution. Uh, they just put an RJ45 jack uh, into the port that doesn't work. Actually, several ports that don't work. And they put the RJ45 jack and cut the cable. And so you just got a, a jack, uh, the actual jack sitting in the switch. Uh, they're assuming that anybody comes up to that piece of equipment will know that not to take that jack, the RJ45 jack, out of the, the equipment and then try to connect something there, or at least wonder why it's there. Uh, I'm not sure that's the what they're talking about here. That is some way of passing on information. I always recommend a uh, having each piece of equipment, or at least each equipment cabinet, having a manual that shows each piece of equipment, what the current status of it, the current a revision of the software that's installed, what has been changed, what is what are the known issues, uh, what uh, has been repaired, what not only what's been repaired, but what was the problem that happened. That way, that way, the 
uh, if the problem happens again, you'll say, ah, we have, we're having a reoccurring problem here. So anyway, documentation is super important. Provide adequate and accurate information on what was performed and, and what was tried. Uh, make sure you check your spelling. Uh, grammar is important, capitalization, punctuation. It's okay to have short sentences, but make sure they're choppy. Make sure you're completing your sentences, right? And avoid technical jargon. Even at my level of teaching computers, every now and then I run across a, an acronym, acronym that I don't know what it means because I haven't seen it before. I've forgotten what it means. It's helpful, remember, every time you write down a, an acronym for the first time to actually write it out. Now, some things you're never going to write out, like auto MDIX. You're not going to write that out because, first of all, the word, I don't even remember what the words are, what that stands for in a, in a Cisco equipment. I know what it does and why we have auto MDI, MDIX. It allows us to use any cable straight through or crossover in between equipment, right? That's what it does. But I can't tell you what the auto MDIX actually stands for. Uh, so there's some things that the actual jargon is what we use as a term, but anything that's unusual, you probably want to spell it out. Also provide updates on the status of a problem. Uh, it's critical uh, when you're having a problem to relate where you are in solving the problem. Don't leave the people that need to know the status of the equipment in the dark. Always update them. Uh, you will be a better technician. You will be a better employee, and you'll be and people will trust you when it's time for a promotion. The following list of guidelines are uh, explain written communication skills when we're dealing with email. Do not use email when a meeting or a phone call is more appropriate. There are just some time there are just some times where a text message is too short, an email uh, is too time late, meaning the person you're sending it to may need to know the information sooner. A phone call followed up by email or a, text, or a text if they don't answer the phone is probably more appropriate. Also, if it's a very complex problem, you don't want to try putting that into a text message or an email uh, or at least follow up with a meeting uh, that explains the situation and then follow up with an email. Include short descriptions, uh, include a short description of the email topic in the subject line. This is critical not only for the person you're sending it to, but also for you later when you're looking through emails, trying to find the email that you sent about a specific problem or topic. Um, it's if you have emails that says, you know, status update, if that's a subject line on the email, well, it could be a status up, update about a lot of things. So you want your email update to be more in depth. Uh, uh, it could be um, status update of the switch to on uh, the uh, uh, in room. Uh, in the server room uh, port issue, right? And and then go in depth in the actual email. Also, uh, send it only send your email only to appropriate people. Do not copy others unnecessarily. Uh, you want to avoid jumping over your boss. So notifying your boss is important. Uh, you don't want the person above your boss to know about the problem and your boss not know. Because then he'll be in the dark when when the second, third level hire asks him what the status is of the equipment and he doesn't know anything about it. So if you send the email to two people and only and your boss doesn't read it, then you could probably be make your boss look bad. So don't do that. Your boss won't appreciate it and uh, and it won't get you any favors. Uh, stick to the point. Do not digress. Whatever is in the subject line, that's what should be in the email. Don't add to that email. If you have another topic to talk about, put it in a different email with a different top subject line. Uh, and of course, use spelling and grammar check in your email too. Remember, email is out there forever, right? Uh, until somebody deletes it. And even then, there's ways to get it back. It's out there forever. So you don't want to 
to have spelling and grammar errors in your written communications that you send on to other people, ultimately you don't know where those emails are ultimately going to go. Uh, who's going to see them in the future? Uh, use proper grammar, punctuation, capitalization. Uh, do not write in all uppercase that is yelling or screaming and that looks bad. Everybody uh, knows it looks bad except for newbies uh, that are new to computers and they just go lazy, right? Lowercase, that's just lazy. Don't write in all lowercase letters, right? Uh, smile when you're typing. That's interesting. Um, at least smile when you're when you get to the good points, you know, and something's good. Smile, right? Somehow your good attitude will come across in your writing. I know that's true with phone calls. Um, I smiling when I'm typing is interesting. Um, if I'm actually trying to be funny, I smile, of course. Uh, focus on the task at hand. Read your note over out loud uh, if it is a critical one to make sure that what you actually wrote is what you intended to write. Write each email as if you are putting the message on a billboard. You never know who, uh, how the content might be used or who might see it. It's critical that your, uh, your message be clear on point some here along the lines here, it also said, uh, um, do not um, write, I don't know where that is, I don't see it anymore, but uh, if you're angry, don't write, maybe it's coming up again a little later, but if you're angry, uh, make sure you, you sit on that message. If you really feel you need to write it out, open a Word document, write, write out the letter uh, in what, what you want to say in the Word document. Sometimes just venting by writing it in a Word document is enough. Uh, save the Word document. The next day, if you still feel that you need to send that message, you can always copy and paste it into your Word doc into your email. But again, remember, you never know where that email is going to end up. Uh, people forward emails all the time. It's super easy. And if you uh, if you if you are sending a message and it's and it's uh, inappropriate or hurtful. Uh, and you uh, and you send it because you're angry. Uh, don't be surprised if you don't have a job anymore, or not in that group anymore, or demotion, or don't get promoted. Who knows? Uh, it's critical that your written skills be um, adequate and appropriate. All right, let's get into the equipment: disassembly and electronic discharge. So sometimes the only way to diagnose a problem is to disassemble the computer outside the case or remove com components one by one, right? So uh, when you are, it's an interesting situation because they'll say, they're saying take the entire computer out and work on it outside of the case. That's unusual. Normally you would work on a computer one component at a time uh, and let all the way down to the motherboard. And if ultimately you determine the motherboard's bad, at that point, everything is already out of the computer. Before you jump into the, the computer, make sure you remove all your jewelry. Jewelry can create shorts. Uh, use proper lifting techniques. Bend at the knees. Ask for help if it's too heavy. Uh, don't hurt yourself. Keep humidity between 45 and 55 percent to reduce the threat of electronic electro, electrostatic discharge (ESD). That's one of the reasons why here in Florida we have high humidity, so we absolutely have to have air conditioning running in our computer rooms to to reduce that electrostatic discharge. I uh, use an anti-static wrist strap, also known as an ESD strap. There's a picture on the next page. Uh, note, do not wear an ESC strap when working inside of a CRT monitor or, or power supply due to the high voltage uh, that are found in both. Anti-static bags are good for storing sp spare adapters and motherboards when the parts are not in use. You'll usually purchase a piece of equipment that comes in these bags. It reduces and eliminates the static uh, in shipping and in handling until you get the equipment. Uh, make sure you're grounded. Uh, with one of these electra electronic straps. Where's my mouse? There it is. I see it. Uh, with one, oh, let me turn on the, um, 
Hmm. Can't find it. I can't find my um, the. Uh, anyway, so uh, here's the electronic strap, and, and you ground it to the case. That way, you are electronically um, uh, uh, neutral with the case that has the equipment that you are touching. That way, you avoid that damage uh, that can be possibly uh, caused by. Uh, the, the static discharge uh, differences in potential between two items that cause electric uh, static electricity. Uh, you, you, I know all of you have had this happen to you where you kind of shuffle your feet on a carpet and then reach out to, to touch grandma and give her a good zap instead. Right? Uh, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about that little bit of electricity uh, that that transfers from you to another person because of the difference in potential. Now, damage to electronic components can be can be done with as little as 30 volts. A uh, human it takes an average of about 300,000 uh, three I'm sorry 3,000 volts to feel that electronic discharge. Um, if you go online on YouTube and you and you watch for is it real, you'll find plenty of people that have have um, assembled and deassembled and assembled a computer without a, a, a wrist strap to prove that it's not real. I promise you, the people that create um, it, it doesn't happen every time. You you don't damage the equipment every time. But you can, it's possible that you can damage the equipment. So just because somebody is lucky enough to uh, disassemble or reassemble in, in a specific environment to, and not have a problem does not mean that people have not damaged electronic equipment. If uh, So make sure you, you take the precautions, especially if you're working on somebody else's equipment, right? You're working with somebody else's dollars that are, that are uh, that have been spent on this equipment, make sure that you you do all the precautions that you can to, to avoid damaging somebody else's equipment. Uh, it's not recoverable. Um, once you damage it, you can't undamage. I mean, you damage the component, you, you have to replace it. Uh, we, at weekends or damages with each event, uh, memory and elect uh, electronics are most susceptible, and you can also use uh, the wrist strap or stay in contact with the grounded part um, uh, when you're using it. Once you have the grounded part in your hand, you, you continue to use it. I've also used, seen elect electrostatic um, ESD gloves, uh, and I have uh, I don't have any myself. I came really close to buying a pair, and I really should have bought a pair uh, instead of uh, the the last time I bought the strip the, because this ended up being kind of awkward when I was building my computer. Uh, but the gloves would have I would have had a lot more freedom with. So I'm not saying they're better. I'm not trying to sell any brand. I'm just saying I wish I had bought the gloves instead of the strap. I still use the strap. Uh, when I was working to build my computer, but I my most recent computer, but I, um, I, I, after I had the strap, I had wished that I had bought the gloves instead. EMI, electromagnetic interference, uh, also known as EMR, electromagnetic radiation, uh, noise caused by electro electrical devices. Many devices can cause EMI. A computer, a pencil sharpener, a vacuum cleaner, an air conditioner, fluorescent lighting. Um, uh, I've heard that uh, people running RJ45 Cat5 cable over fluorescent lights uh, in, uh, in uh, production actually introduce quite a bit of uh, EMI interference in the signal to the point where they had to pull that wire out and rerun it so that it wasn't being interfered with. You can also use CAT6 ca cable, CAT8, ca CAT7, CAT8, uh, better cable uh, with more shielding to avoid that, that uh, interference. Um, I personally had EMI issues with my computer about five years, eh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, I had a TV card with Direct TV. I had a TV card in my computer so I can play my Direct TV uh, in on my computer, one of my screens. I don't do that anymore. Uh, now everything's streamed. But this was before streaming, and I had uh, I had a problem with the Direct TV box that, as it sat next to my computer, uh, it would 
I would get all sorts of interference on the screen uh, from the signal. But if I put that same box in a different a different room, uh, a different computer, or a different location, it worked perfectly fine. A technician came out to the house. We spent about an hour before we finally realized that there was just too much EMI being emitted from something over by my computer. I don't know what it is, what it was, I should say. Uh, but all I had to do was move that box uh, eight feet away from my computer and all the interference went away. So who knows what it was? If you think you know, go ahead and put a note down in the comment section if you're looking, watching this video on YouTube. A specific type uh, EMI, a specific type that negative, negatively affects computers is RFI, radio frequency interference, and it could have been RFI uh, that created uh, that problem as well. RFI is noise that occurs in the radio frequency range. Uh, check the surrounding devices for the source of the problem. If a computer goes down only when the pencil sharpener operates or when using the optical drive, EMI can be to blame. It can also come through power lines. So move the computer to a different wall outlet or to a totally different circuit to determine whether the power outlet is the problem source. Uh, I've also heard things like microwave, anything in that 2.4 um, megahertz, uh, they, can, they can create some interference uh, if we're dealing with wireless, for example. Uh, EMI can affect files on a hard drive. Tools. Uh, tools can be divided into two categories, those that you should not leave the office without and tools that are nice to have in the office, home, or car. Uh, the uh, and then they they say what you really need uh, is are these tools right? These are the absolute you need you've got to have. Ninety five percent of all repairs are completed with the following basic tools: small and medium size flat tip and uh, Phillips screwdrivers, right? Number one, number two, number zero Phillips screwdrivers, uh, quarter uh, and three six three sixteenth inch hex nut drivers small di di uh, diagonal cutters and needle node pl nose pliers. This is just the tip of the iceberg of what you ultimately we will be buying. I really should, before this video, I should have grabbed my, my uh, toolbox. It's not the most professional one, it's just at the home, uh, but this, is, this toolbox includes things like a, a, a power supply checker. When I, one day, um, one of the uh, big online retailers uh, sent an ad to me for a uh, a power supply checker, and and the the part was I don't know ten dollars. It was so cheap. It was like sure, I'll buy one of those and throw it in my toolbox. I didn't use it for two or three years, and then one day I had a questionable power supply. I connected that power supply checker to the equipment. Sure enough, I had a bad power supply. I could have spent hours trying to troubleshoot the, the problems that were going on in that computer, but instead having that $10 tool. I think over time, you will build a toolbox that has a lot of different tools uh, that you collect as you need them for different troubleshooting, for different pieces of equipment. That toolbox will become bigger, heavier, but more useful as time passes. Disassembly. Do not remove the motherboard battery or the configuration information in CMOS will be lost. Use proper grounding procedures, unless that's what you want to do. If you want to clear the CMOS, remove the battery. Uh, use proper grounding procedures to prevent ESD damage, as we described earlier. Keep paper, a pen, a phone, and a digital camera nearby for note-taking, diagramming, and photo-taking. I cannot tell you how useful it has become to take pictures before I start disassembling or assembling a computer. I love to take step-by-step -step pictures, especially if I'm taking something apart. Even if it's something as simple as where all of the different graphics card uh, DVI ports uh, run, um, I, I love taking pictures so that later I have a record of what it was like before I took things apart. Um, also, as I put it in, I take a picture as I put things in. Uh, therefore, that way I have a re recording of what I completed. Now, 
pen and paper is also important so you can kind of note the changes that you made especially with configuration uh, commands that you have typed in your computer but those pictures have come in so handy uh, maybe it's my age I'm not sure but I can't tell you back in the day how many times I pulled something apart and then couldn't remember uh, how it went back together again and then just had to really troubleshoot. An example of that, just speaker wires going to the back of a stereo with left and right, uh, front, left and right front speakers. They have a red and a black, uh, uh, front left, front right. Uh, side speakers, rear speakers. That's a lot of wires in the back of the stereo. Uh, so. Uh, same thing's true with computers. Um, so many things are connected to a computer that it's handy uh, to to have a record of what it was like before you took it apart so you know uh, to put it back together the same way. Have ample flat and clean workspace. Um, um, I'm not going to show you my workspace because <laughs> my wife tells me it's neither flat nor clean. Uh, I mean clean. It's not like filled with garbage, but I have so many computer parts in my office that I, I really need to get more organized. When remove and you need to have at least one clean workspace where you're when you're building something so that you can uh, keep things organized. Uh, when removing adapters, do not stack the adapters on top of one another. Uh, the equipment can actually damage each other uh, piece of equipment. Um, you can also mix up your adapters or your wires your connectors if something's working let i have four i have five screens but i have four screens uh, connected to this one computer and i like to keep the cables that are working perfectly fine connected to the computers that they're connected to i don't like to mix them all up and just reorder them now that might just be me but if it's working i don't like to mess with it i've found over time if it's working just Reorganizing for the sake of reorganizing is not a great idea. Place removed adapter inside a special ESD protective bag to be especially careful with um, ESD issues, and they also protect the parts somewhat. Handle each adapter, motherboard, and processor on a single on the edges, on the side edges. Uh, avoid touching the gold contacts on the bottom of the adapters. A sweat, oil, and dirt can cause problems. Not immediately, although it could, but over time, uh, that that uh, your oil and the sweat and dirt that you put into the that you add each time you touch that computer, if you're not holding it and and handling it with care. Uh, over time, it will cause problems. It could, if you have really dirty hair, and it could happen in the first time. But uh, remember that hard drives require careful handling. A very small jolt, jolt can cause damage to stored data. You can damage a hard drive. A removal, uh, literally a spinning platter, can be damaged just dropping it a foot. Uh, you can remove a power supply, but do not disable a, CR, a CRT style monitor, a dis disassemble a CRT style monitor or power supply without proper training and tools. I can tell you, I have taken apart one power supply in my life, and I was really nervous when I did because I, I made sure it was, it was there was nothing plugged into the wall. The cord was completely disconnected. Uh, I was grounded when I did it. Uh, when I touched the outside of the case, then I took off the grounding strap when I went into the case. And I was really cautious uh, because sometimes power supplies can have power stored in capacitors uh, that you're not aware of. If you're just haphazardly handling the inside of a power supply, you could feel the electrical um, electricity that's stored in those caps. Um, you need to. I the reason why I opened it up is I had a fan that went bad on me. It 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 was literally just really noisy. It hadn't stopped spinning. It wasn't noisy per, before. So I I all I was doing was disconnecting a fan and re reassembling that fan. Uh, most many power supplies come with extended warranties of five and ten years. Um, I always try to buy a power supply that has a 10 year or longer warranty. That way, uh, if I ever have a problem with the power supply, I can just send it back to the manufacturer and I don't have to open it and mess with the insides of the, the power supply. 
Uh, document screw and cable locations. Label them if possible. I have seen uh, several, I, I didn't order it myself, but I have seen several online YouTubers that have mats uh, that sit on their assembly table and the mats actually have uh, drawn into them uh, different uh, locations to put screws and whatnot. Now be cautious about that. You could easily, if you just have the, the screws sitting on a mat and you move your computer and you're not careful, you could push those screws into other screws. It can ultimately make a mess. So a better idea is to have some sort of small plastic container that has multiple um, holders. I often just ask my wife for several plastic dishes and I throw the, the screws into the plastic dishes. Um, I also, I do have, a, I don't have a handy, but uh, a, compu a computer I per case that I purchased once actually came with a really nice uh, small plastic uh, multi-compartment uh, um, uh, case. Uh, that I that came with a whole bunch of screws all uh, divided, and then I've continued to use that case. Um, and uh, I don't, I'd show it to you right now, but I'm not sure exactly where it is. It's in one of these, like I said, not really organized, but um, anyway, something I got to do. It's on my to do list. Uh, document screw and cable locations, label them if possible. Uh, you can label in the uh, in the little dishes my wife has given me the plastic uh, Tupperware type stuff. Um, I just put a piece of paper in there and say what what the screws go to to help me remember where to put them back. Uh, disassemble basic steps: remove power, external cables. Uh, make sure you remove the power; it's critical. Um, otherwise, you you might ultimately touch something that you, that could give you a little zap or worse. Open the case, remove internal cables and the connectors, remove adapters, remove storage devices, uh, remove your RAM. That's not listed there, but it, uh, that might be what they mean by storage devices, hard drives, storage devices, uh, RAM. Uh, and then ultimately at the end, remove the motherboard. Generally, you don't remove the CPU um, until it, the motherboard is outside of the case. That's not a, a given. Uh, if you're only removing the mother, uh, the uh, CPU and the motherboard is staying in the case, then by all means, you can um, you can uh, leave the motherboard in and then remove the CPU. But if you're, if you're replacing the CPU and the motherboard, obviously you have to take them both out. Uh, here's another example of where a picture could ha come in handy. Uh, honest, um, disassembly, uh, make sure you take a picture of that uh, the motherboard and cables that go into the front panel, especially, uh, or have the manual handy. That's what you built your computer with the very first time. Uh, but the, having a picture of this will definitely help you to remember where to put those, those switches when you, um, those um, adapters when you, cables when you're putting your computer back together. Reassembly. Be careful and properly diagram the re disassembly. All right. Okay, reassembly. By carefully uh, diagramming the disassembly, it helps to reassemble your equipment. Uh, write reminders, take photos, reinsert all the components into their proper place. Be careful to replace all screws and parts. Install missing slot covers. Uh, it, it matters to the airflow of your computer. You don't necessarily want the air coming through a hole uh, on the back of the computer, this is not probably the best place to have air coming into your case unless you want it to be. Uh, if if removing these um, slot covers uh, allows air to, to flow better to your, um, it looks like they have a fan here, uh, then that's okay. Uh, that's what these holes are for, but perhaps you want to cover it with some sort of screen or or purchase a screen that that you can that you can place over the cover to stop people from sticking their fingers in. Um, in my class, if you take my class in person, uh, I'm not, I'm I'm going to tell on myself right now. I've actually had uh, a student cut their finger on one of these these slot things just because the edge here. They they pull this off to put a, uh, a expansion card in, and they weren't careful, and they actually 
uh, ran their finger along this metal edge right here, and just like a knife, it cut their finger. It didn't. I'm sure it hurt. It was shocking. Um, everybody moved away from the student. A Band-Aid solved the problem. But it hurt. I'm sure it hurt that student. So be careful uh, when you're dealing with um, computers. There can be sharp, sharp edges. And uh, installing the missing slots avoids people from sticking their fingers in there and, cut and getting cut. Uh, when, when, when reinstalling a motherboard, reverse the procedure that you use during disassembly. That just makes sense. Ensure the motherboard is securely seated into the case and all of the retaining clips and or screws are replaced. So every motherboard, depending on if you have an ATX or a, uh, ITX or a E uh, ATX extended ATX. Make sure that you have you're using the right extenders off of the case bottom for the motherboard to connect to. And the only way to know that is ultimately ultimately to line up the motherboard over the case, looking through the holes to make sure you have the little stud that you put under the motherboard for the screw to go through the motherboard. And you need all of them. Don't just put one or two or three. It has to do uh, with the when you're pushing uh, like a video card, a new video card into the slot, you don't want the pressure from pushing the video card into the slot to to unnaturally pave the the motherboard in a way that it's not expecting. By adding all the screws where they belong on the motherboard, you're you're providing the base for that that to support the video card being pulled pushed into the PCIe slot. Ensure the ports extend fully from the case through the I.O. shield. Uh, that will help all of your screw holes to be lined up. That's what they're talking about here. Make sure you use the, I, uh, the I.O. shield. Uh, that is one of the most critical, uh, especially with older computers. In newer computers, uh, the, uh, it's integrated. Uh, the I.O. shield is integrated uh, with the motherboard, with the, the brand new computers. Uh, but each motherboard is is unique and and the case uh, has a big hole in it and this io shield um, properly supports all of the, the the individual ports that are on the back of the motherboard this io shield connects on the inside of the computer and then this uh, and then your motherboard pushes through the io shield uh, to be able to get to, uh, to 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 reach the outside, make sure it's seated properly, uh, in order to ensure that when you're pushing you know, into these ports, uh, first of all, you can get through the shield, but the the shield somewhat supports uh, the um, the the uh, pushing through uh, the your pressure. Ensure the drivers and covers are aligned properly when the case is reinst uh, reinstalled. Ensure cables are fully attached to the devices and the same and the same motherboard connector they were connected to earlier, unless you're planning on rerunning like a fan or something. Ensure the power cables are securely securely attached to the individual uh, items like hard drives and SSDs. Preventative maintenance. Uh, a computer in normal working environment should be cleaned at least once a year. A year, once a year? Uh, my goodness, I believe computers should be cleaned much more off, off, um, often. Uh, vacuum the computer and clean the optical drive laser, keyboard keys, and printers and display screen. If you want to see something pretty gross, uh, take your take your phone. Uh, turn on the camera uh, and uh, make sure you have a light and take a picture of your keyboard. Unless you have a new keyboard that you've replaced within the last, say, year, your keyboard is filthy. I promise you, your keyboard is disgustingly filthy. <laughs> Every keyboard that I have seen uh, in an office that has not had maintenance done to it, uh, the best anybody does is run a... Uh, a um, uh, a, a cloth over it, one of those little screen cleaning cloths. They run over the top, but in between all of those keys, we have um, pretty yucky stuff, hair and dead skin and 
puffy and crumbs and you need to clean that all right you need to you need to take a look at your keyboards on a regular basis to make sure that they are not filthy and germ carrying disgusting tools right um do it go take a picture of your keyboard i promise you if you haven't cleaned it in the last year it's pretty disgusting um uh, I had a, uh, a tool that I, it was a, uh, a CD-ROM drive uh, and I, and, and it was for cleaning. I just slid it into my CD-ROM drive and it had a little brush on it. And as it spun, it cleaned the laser. Uh, that was useful back when I had a CD-ROM. Now, nowadays we don't, we generally don't have CD-ROMs um, in our computers, but if you still have a CD-ROM, that laser needs to be cleaned as well. And you might want to uh, check on your favorite online shopping uh, place for a, a CD-ROM cleaner, uh, and it should look like a CD-ROM disc with a little brush on it that spins and cleans the uh, laser pointer, especially if you're having a problem. You may not have to replace the, the CD-ROM. You might just have to clean the laser. They get dirt and debris uh, that drops into the, the receiver of the laser on a regular basis, or it might actually block the laser. I've seen it where it blocked the, the mirror that was collecting the data. Always ensure that the device has proper ventilation and the vents are clear of any obstructions. When I talk about cleaning my computer more often than once a year, I'm really talking about the the outside uh, ventilation and the vents. I, I clean those probably once a month, um, at least once every two months. Okay, so I have three dogs, right? So I have a lot of uh, dog hair that floats around. Uh, my house, uh, unfortunately, and uh, but that's what you do when you love a dog. You have dog hair, cat hair. I have a couple of those. Uh, so, anyways, I just take the saw. I take my vacuum cleaner. I make sure the computer's off. Take my vacuum cleaner. It has a, a little brush on the uh, one of the adapters, and I just gently uh, uh, brush uh, over all of my vents and with sucking the air, and then. And then I blow, after I've sucked all of the outside on all of the vents, then I, I flip it around and actually blow uh, air into the computer, then removing any air, any dust and hair that has collected. My main computer doesn't have sides. It's an open air computer. Um, I clean it. Uh, on a regular basis. Now, just remember, turn off your equipment, make sure you're using a plastic uh, vacuum cleaner and you can suck first and then blow afterwards. And you should, it should actually help your computer to run cooler um, than, especially my video cards. I have to uh, clean the fans on those often because those uh, fans run uh, pretty much 24 seven. Always ensure the device has proper ventilation uh, to ensure that uh, your devices are keeping cool. Power supply. Power supply overview. A power supply is an essential computer component within a computer. Internal computer devices cannot work without it. All the devices, motherboard, uh, all of the devices connected to the motherboard all need power. The power supply converts AC from the wall to DC, distributes the DC in different voltage levels to the components throughout your computer, and provides cooling through the use of a fan located inside the power supply. That was the fan I was describing how I had to replace it. The AC voltage a power supply accepts is either 100 to, two, 100 to 120, that's what we have here in the United States, or 200 to 240. Sometimes in the back of the power supply, there's actually a switch that you can switch from 120 to 240. 240 uh, is a cleaner signal and it actually uses less power than 120. Uh, form factors. Power supplies come in different shapes, sizes, uh, and do as uh, soda cases that they fit into. The power supply must match the case and provide enough power to all devices. Laptop power supplies are commonly proprietary. Uh, a case, uh, a, just talk about a general case, build a, a PC, uh, there are multiple different size 
power supplies and you need to make sure that your case fits the power supply that you ultimately order. This is a power supply that I actually ordered for one of my crypto mining rigs. And uh, it's actually 1600 watts. I know all of you hardcore miners out there, I doubt if any of you are watching this video, but hardcore miners out there know that I probably could have bought a much cheaper power supply than this EVGA uh, power 1600 uh, watt power supply. Now I did because I put it into a personal computer and I didn't want to have a um, uh, a server power supply running my running everything else in my rig. I probably could have, uh, but I love this power supply. It runs quiet, runs smooth, and look at all those adapters. This is called a modular power supply where you, the power cords come separately uh, from. Uh, the the actual power supply itself, so I can connect a multitude of different uh, devices and only connect uh, the cables into the ports I actually use. If I don't have five or was that five VGA ports, I don't need to put a cable in there. One less cable that's sitting in my computer. Now. This often, uh, especially with older computers and less expensive power supplies, they'll have cables built right in, the cables will be connected uh, to the power supply um, and uh, you can't disconnect. So any port that you're not, any, any power cord that you're not using ends up just sitting in your computer. Uh, and if you need more, uh, in this example, they have slots uh, for additional ports, but oft, uh, many, especially older power supply, don't have any module. This this power, power supply here would be a hybrid. It has both built-in cabling for the motherboard, for example, and then it has the uh, uh, separate for your, um, looks like PCI, uh, oh, I can't read what that says, but it could be PCI ports for your video cards. Power supply, what's the purpose of it? Well, the power supply from the wall outlet is a high voltage AC, but the power, the computer needs a low voltage DC. Power supplies in general come in two types, linear and switching. Uh, computers use switching power supplies. Power supply functions, converts AC to DC for the third time, provides DC voltages to motherboards, adapters, and peripheral devices, provides cooling and facilitates the airflow through the case. Well, it does somewhat help depending on how you have your power supply connected. One of the sides, let me go back to the picture here. One of the sides will have, maybe even my picture, um, one of the side, here's the power cord right here. It's kind of hard to see and I can't figure out how to zoom in. Oh, here it is. Zoom in. That's this one. So here, um, wherever the power is, that's going to be on the outside of your case. Right here is a vent that allows air into the power supply um, or out, depending on how you have your power supply labeled. Now this thing spins this way, it's put it pulling air from the case into the power supply and then out the back. Um, if, it's, if you have it flipped around, you might have air being pulled uh, in from outside. If this is flipped over and, and facing the outside, then it would be pulling air in I've had it on the bo bottom of my computer, for example. Uh, bo from the bottom of my computer, it flows in through this side and then, and then, um, and then out. So none of the heat that's generated from the power supply actually enters the computer case. And of course, there's different layouts, but that that's the general gist of how power supplies cool. Uh, and let's see. Um, yep. uh, symptoms of power supply problems. The following list of symptoms of power supply problems. So the power light is off and the device won't turn on. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a symptom. Uh, the power supply fan does not turn when the computer is powered on. Now, that's not always the case, though. Some power supplies, the fan only comes on when the power supply needs the fan. One of the notes um, about a power supply is that uh, to to run your to run your equipment efficiently, your power supply should be two times the total wattage of the equipment that's in your in your system. Now that's not always possible, but whenever it can be, 
uh, that's what that's the power supply you should purchase. So you add up all the power, all the power. Let's say you have one thirty ninety video card that carries thirty three hundred watts. Then you have a couple hard drives, a motherboard, um, and uh, what else? You have RAM. You add up all of, and when you when you look, um, maybe you have a little uh, a, a bit of um, um, RGB going. Uh, you add up all the voltage. You can find all the voltage draw on all of those equipment on the motherboard on the manuals for the equipment that we're talking about, uh, or uh, you can find uh, a website uh, like uh, I think it's a uh, partpicker.com. Uh, as you build equipment, it actually adds up the voltages you need. But your power supply should be twice the amount. So if you add up to uh, 300, well, my example of a of a video card with 300 watts, let's say everything else is another 100 watts, so I'm at 400 watts, I should buy an 800 power, 800 watt power supply at the minimum. If I have two video cards, now I'm at 700 watts, and then now you might know why I had to buy a 1600 watt power supply. If you're at less than half of the rated voltage of the power supply, then the fan does, and the fan is built to only run when needed, then your power supply fan will probably not run uh, if you're only at half of the voltage level or less. Not guaranteed, just that's a that's the standard that I have uh, I have worked with and it always works in the uh, in my past. When the computer powers on, another symptom could be that it does not beep at all. Uh, when you, of course, that could be you don't have a speaker, um, a little speaker that's connected to some of those ports on the motherboard. Uh, will will give you your beep code, your your um, uh, what is that? Your um, power on self test, your post beep codes. Uh, and that indicates uh, if it does sound, maybe you get repeated short beeps. Now, I always like to go to the internet to find uh, the post codes, uh, and I'll you just search post code beep. It might be some of the some some of your studying to know what the different sounds that a postcode can make on your when it comes to beeps uh, before you go in and take that A plus certification. It's useful information as a technician if you memorize those beeps. I've talked to multiple technicians over the years uh, that they say, "What does it sound like when you turn on the computer?" And they say, "Oh, I went." It's just one long beep and then nothing happens afterwards. And they say, oh, you got a blank. And it's like in their brain, somehow they memorize what the beeping sounds are for the postcodes. Uh, but that means something. Um, my computer uh, on the motherboard has a has a, um, a little LED that has the postcodes just written. It's just numbers. And then I go to the manual and it tells me what those codes stand for. So I don't get beeps on mine. I just have a reading and it tells me I have to go look up 35 or 57 and it tells me what what's going on with my motherboard if it doesn't load. The computer reboots of the power or powers down without warning. That's an indication and if it powers down without warning is it and it's the power power supply issue. What it's doing is it's trying to protect the equipment. There's not enough power being applied to push the equipment that you currently have in your system. Uh, and I've actually seen that again uh, with multiple with the power supply with multiple video cards. Um, I was underpowered uh, when I was messing around with with um, uh, running multiple power supply, uh, video cards at the very beginning and my computer would just turn off. It would just turn off and it was like, oh, that can't be good. And uh, it turned off to the point where it didn't even give me a uh, in any of the Windows logs. It didn't even tell me why it was turning off. It just turned off. And ultimately, I replaced the power supply. That problem went away. Uh, and that now, again, you know, I have a 16 watt power supply, 1600 watt power, uh, 1600 watt power supply. Uh, and uh, and I had that problem with a, uh, a, a noisy fan. You can replace it, but be very very careful when you're inside of that power supply. Additional symptoms uh, during post, I, you might see a 02x or parity post error appear. Uh, one of the post checks is a power good signal from the power supply. A 021 or a 022 error message indicates that the power supply did not pass the post test. Again, here is an example of 
something that you is probably an A plus question. You want to make sure that you uh, take a look at the postcodes and have a good idea of what they do. Now you don't have to know all of them. Just do the common postcodes, and maybe make some flashcards with them so that you can uh, learn them not only to pass the A plus certification but also to be a better technician. Um, you all uh, a hot power supply could be a problem. Uh, you could smell burning. Uh, the power supply fan spins, but there's no power to any devices. Uh, the monitor has a power light, but nothing actually appears on the monitor, and no PC power light illuminates. Um, that's uh, the power. They're talking about the, the power going to a power supply. Um, uh, if you have an external power supply, most most monitors have an external power supply. Power protection. Power protection. Computers need a steady stream of AC that the power supply converts to DC. Sometimes the AC voltage is too high or too low. Protection can be provided with the following devices. Just a surge suppressor that will protect against over voltage uh, and it might include a warranty. So I live in a state that has a lot of lightning. And so every single thing that I have connected to the wall in my house is actually connected to a UPS. It used to be uh, to a surge suppressor, uh, but then I upped it to a UPS. Now what a UPS is, is un uninterruptible power supply. Not only does it protect against over uh, voltage with surges from uh, lightning strikes, for example, uh, but it also conditions the voltage. So if it's going too low or too high or off completely, if I have a brownout in my house, the UPS actually protects my equipment. I highly recommend buying a UPS. They're, they're more pricey than you would want them to be. Um, a, pro, a UPS can cost anywhere from $50 to $400 or more, depending on how much wattage your computer draws, your your it's not just the, how long the UPS will stay online, but the UPS has to be rated for the power that's in your equipment. So that uh, example of a computer that's connected to the 1600 watt power supply, I couldn't afford a UPS uh, that, would, uh, that would provide conditioning for 1600 watts so I had to just go with a, a surge suppressor. Um, they exist, UPS, but I was not gonna spend $1,000 on a 1600 watt UPS. Um, if you have any suggestions for that, you can drop that in the comments down below as well. Uh, if you find a, a deal on a UPS uh, that will uh, handle, because I'm nervous. I have a lot of equipment that's going through a standard surge suppressor uh, and brownouts are common in Florida. And I really wish my, uh, my mining rig was connected to a uh, UPS for multiple reasons. Uh, line conditioner connect, uh, conditions uh, the AC voltage from the wall before it passes to the computer. And SPS um, provides power during an outage. Um, SPS, we cover all of these terms uh, in chapter nine. Okay, two. Uh, the, the magic of uh, recording and pause is uh, I went ahead and to help you better understand what an SPS is, I have a link. So uh, this link will take us out of the, uh, the course into the Pearson IT certification uh, website. Again, uh, this textbook that we're using uses Pearson and um, Comp CompTIA Basics in here is a good example. Um, of the standby power supply SPS. So it's a it's similar to a UPS, uh, but an, a standby power supply contains a battery like a UPS, but the battery provides power to the computer only when it loses AC power. It does not provide constant power like a UPS. An SPS is not as effective as a UPS because at the, the SPS must detect the power out condition first and then switch over to battery to supply power to the computer. As a result, SPS switching time is important. Any time under five milliseconds is fine for most systems. And then here is an example of both SPS in line with the UPS 
and then uh, UPS uh, without the SPS uh, in the bottom picture. And you can see the difference between the two. Uh, the, and hopefully that helps you to understand the concept, this switch. It actually explains this. You can hit pause uh, and read the whole vault. Um, let me zoom in. Let's take a look. Let's see if, let's see if I can go in closer. No, not, not going to get closer because it's a website. Um, when high voltage, okay, so um, normal operation, AC power is brought through the UPS. The battery is charging simultaneous with some units. Small over or under voltages are evened out. Uh, that's what a UPS does, why they're wonderful. Uh, when you have an SPS line, interactive UPS, abnormal power operation, uh, the dash line you see, uh, when high voltage or large under voltage for some units uh, with a, the loss of power is presented in all units, DC power from the battery is sent to the inverter for as long as the battery lasts. The DC power is converted to AC and provided to the attached devices. <laughs> and um, and then, of course, your computer is plugged into the switch. All right. Uh, and that is the end of our presentation. Of course, you want to review the computer terms located at the end of the chapter. Make sure you understand all of them. And uh, this is our textbook, the eighth edition. Uh, it is um, Cheryl Smith's Complete A Plus Guide to IT Hardware and Software. And that is the end of the presentation. All right. So hopefully this presentation uh, has given you a starting point uh, to prepare, uh, if you're with me uh, in class, uh, to prepare for your homework because you got some homework to do uh, this week. Uh, and a quiz to take. If you are watching this video out on YouTube, remember this is just an introduction to some of the concepts that you are going to use, uh, need to understand when you are preparing for your A-plus certification. So hopefully it's useful to you as at least a basis to then build specific knowledge uh, in, over, over time. Uh, if you are watching this live in a moment, we're going to have an opportunity for you to ask questions. If you are asking, if you are watching this as a recording inside of my uh, uh, Canvas classroom, please ask your questions in the help discussion forums. And if you are on YouTube, first of all, thank you for being with us uh, through this whole presentation. I appreciate that. Please like and subscribe so other people can find my videos. Also. Uh, you can hit the notification bell so when I hit, when I re re record, I haven't yet, uh, well, at least in the summer of 2022, I haven't recorded all of the videos yet and I'm recording them as I go through the class. So if you uh, if you want to see the next video, hit that notification icon and it will notify you when the next video has been released. Again, my name is Don LaFont. It's been a pleasure teaching you today, and I hope hopefully you learned something. Uh, good luck. Enjoy teaching. I'm sorry. Enjoy learning uh, about hardware this week, and I'll see you next week. Bye now.